Greetings today from Botswana. We often hear the phrase, God is love, which appears two times in scripture, both times in 1 John chapter 4, about eight verses apart, verses 8 and 16. And we can be thankful that God is love, but he is much more than love. And though we hear this, we take comfort in this, well, God is love. But did you know that the scripture says also that the first and great commandment is that we shall love the Lord our God with everything, with all of our being, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so I'd just like to talk today a little bit about the importance of loving God. This is something that is really an advantage for us, and i just like to go over this a bit. Some of you may be familiar with the little song that goes, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This, this little chorus that we sing, which is very precious, also kind of mirrors uh, at least Matthew 6.22. There is another place, I believe it's in Luke, where we are told this, about the importance of having our eye single. Jesus is saying this during the Sermon on the Mount about having our eye single. And that's what it is. We are keeping our, our focus upon Jesus, our focus upon the Lord. And when we have our eyes single like that, our body is filled with light. And this is really what I'm coming to uh, the realization of. And this is, we all need to love God and love Jesus more. And this isn't just to make him feel better about himself. I think the Lord is very content in his position in the universe as the creator and judge and, and whatnot. But it really gives us Christians an advantage. You know, when we look at this, it's an advantage for Christian living. It helps us to fulfill our service better when we really love the Lord. And it also helps us to resist temptation because we're seeing this. We're seeing everything that we do, you know, with respect to our love for God. You can think of that a little bit like a marriage, at least, uh, well, my marriage is like that. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, we're perfect or anything, but you can think of that. Your love for your spouse really drives you to do or not do a lot of things, and you do it out of love. You know, you don't really do it out of obligation, and that's something very important. If you started going down by obligation in trying to serve the Lord, then uh, something is missing. It really needs to come from inside. So the question would be, how do we love God more? And my first answer is, you know, we have to pray because we do not in our natural selves love God. What I'm saying is the flesh is naturally in rebellion against him. And even as Christians, of course, we struggle with the flesh our whole lives, as we see in places like Romans chapter 7. But if we look at James chapter 1, in verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, ask of God, who gives to all men liberally without and without reproach, and it shall be given him. So that tells us to turn to God. But also, in verse 17, it says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And so, obviously, loving, loving God would actually come from him. And... We need, so we seek him, we go to him for that. It can be a challenge. Obviously, God is invisible, but he is very real. He is the living God. And we should pray that God will make us uh, much more loving toward him. But the number one thing that I see in terms of loving God is being thankful. One of the qualities of last day's man, mankind, as I find in Second Timothy chapter 3, uh, it's in verses 1 through 5. It might be about verse 3. I don't know exactly. It's one of the qualities is that men are unthankful. You know, we are not thanking God uh, for anything. The number one thing that we ought to be thankful for is redemption. And I want to get that. I want to spend a little bit more time with that in a moment. But that is by far the, the first thing, the first reason that we should be thankful the second reason would be our daily provisions. We have bread, we have clothing, we have homes, we have loved ones. I mean, there are a lot of things we have to be thankful for, and all of these things come of his hand. 
sometimes, I mean, around here, uh, a lot of people just want more. They want something they don't have. They want something they see someone else has. Well, that's being covetous. How about we try to be thankful first? Because this life here is not going to last. And that is finally the, the third thing about being thankful, and that is for the benefits of eternal life. As the word says, the eye has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man, that which the Lord has for those that love him. Those that love him, remember? And that's what we're trying to provide uh, here. But I really want to spend some time on this, being thankful for our redemption. You know, we've had so long to deal with the message of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins I do feel like we, we take it for granted a lot. It gets kind of watered down. And at least around here and, and in light of the prosperity gospel, uh, there really isn't much talk about sin or the need for repentance or the cross or, or anything. And so Jesus' blood sacrifice, taking the wrath of God upon himself for us, just gets kind of diluted, buried. We don't see it for what it really is. I just see that in Mark 2, 17, this is one of the places Jesus was saying that he had come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And we know that there are none righteous. So in other words, unless you are seeing yourself as a sinner, you cannot be called to repentance. And so it's very important that we would know that. But I want to share this, just this, this deep example of what it means to love. Now, this is from Luke chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 41 through 47. This had to do, this was Mary. She had anointed the feet of Jesus with oil. She got criticized for this. You can see these, these uh, accounts in the other books, but I'm going to focus on this from Luke 7. Jesus is speaking here. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will he love most? Simon, the Pharisee he was with, answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And Jesus said to him, Thou hast answered, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And 48, he said to the woman, thy sins are forgiven. So what we see is one of the advantages, uh, per se, to knowing that you're a sinner and that you're a big sinner is that you, if you come to repentance, you're going to love Jesus all the more. Unfortunately, today, there are only too many that see themselves as righteous, even as this one was doing, as Simon was doing here. Uh, he, was, he was kind of despising the woman. He was saying that if, if Jesus were really a prophet, he would know what kind of a woman she is and that she's a sinner. Uh, she knew she was a sinner and she needed forgiveness. We need to know that. We need to recognize what the Lord has done for us. We need to recognize what our station is before God if we don't have him. And so this is something I would really encourage you to meditate on, to pray about. It is just the thankfulness, you know, for what we have. It's one of the problems I've been seeing here uh, it, within this prosperity gospel and the covetous nature just generally of the people around, and that is, they're not being thankful for what they have. They're always looking to what someone else has. And they have enough. I mean, they have food, they have clothing, they have homes. And this is where I think we have really gone astray in these last days. We're not thankful. We kind of, we're kind of uh, presumptuous in thinking we deserve these things. And you know, God is a great God. He has promised if we seek him first, he will provide for all of our needs. He's going to give us a, an eternity with him without, without pain, without need, without diseases going around. How much do we have to be thankful for? 
the next the next part of it I like I like to mention is so what kind of evidence could we look for that would indicate that you know we are you know loving God more these are these are just ways in which you know you, you know you can't it has to come from inside you can't just manufacture it but uh, the Bible tells us that there are evidences of these things which are telling us that we really love Jesus more these are not in any particular order one thing is we must recognize that our sins are against God. That sounds pretty profound, but what I'm saying is maybe we hurt someone and we're just got kind of, uh, disagreement, oh, these things happen. Well, we should go back and apologize maybe if that's what it takes. I'm not, I can't, I don't know your situation, but we recognize it as a sin against God. You see this both with Joseph and with David. You know, they're reflecting that their sins like David's sin, he did sin with Bathsheba. His sin was against God. He reflects on that in Psalm 51. Uh, for Joseph, Potiphar's wife wanted to have intercourse with him. And one of his responses, one part of his response said, how can I sin against God like this? And Jesus said, if you have not done it to the least of these, you have not done it to me. So whatever we are doing, we are doing to God. And that is one way that we can really know. I mean, that's going to help us. That helps us to avoid sin, to avoid temptation, to be repentant where there is a need for repentance. Uh, so that's a very important point, uh, I think. I see other evidence in like uh, John chapter 21. I believe it's verses 15 to 17. This is the end of, of, of John where Jesus is asking Peter, Peter, do you love me? And if you love me, you will feed my sheep. This is a classic thing. We want to help other believers. We want to feed them. This is a sign if we love Jesus. In John 14, 23, Jesus said, what did he say? He said, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. We want to keep Jesus' words. In 1 John 5, 3, he says that, uh, it says that if we love God, we keep his commandments and they are not grievous to us. It's not a burden. We want to please God. We love him. After all he did for us, it's not part of a work salvation. It's something we just do out of love. And you might know that even in a marriage, we do many things out of love. It's not out of obligation. We just love the person. We want them to be happy. And that's the way it ought to be between us and the Savior, that personal, close relationship that he desires. And again, another part in 1 John was from 3.22. It reads, uh, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. God, is this pleasing in your sight? Maybe you don't have a full knowledge of the scripture. There's usually something in there that can steer us. But if you don't, and the spirit of God is living in you, he will be showing you what is pleasing to him. And that's what we should seek for. I also mentioned different things like from, from Luke. From Luke 9, 23, we read Jesus saying that if anyone would come after him, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow him. And so we need to know that our love for God and our following of him are not always going to feel good. We're denying who we are in the flesh so that we can come after Jesus for what he has done and inherit the promise that he wants us to have eternal life. And also from Luke 17, 10, one of my favorite scriptures, as you might know if you watch this, is that when we have done that, which is our duty to do, say we are unprofitable servants. Uh, I don't think I quoted that right. After you have done all that is commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that, which is our duty to do. And I am glad to serve God after his will, whether or not it looks like anything is left to profit either materially or spiritually, if people don't like me, uh, too bad. But I love the Lord, and truly I want to live in a pleasing way for him. Now, all of these scriptures I have listed, I hope, uh, maybe not all, <laughs> most of them are in the description below. I'm also going to give a link to a song called The Mission by a Christian artist, Steve Green, which I think describes it very well. Uh, sometimes we listen to it for inspiration. To love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission, the spring from which our service overflows. So please seek to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your being in everything you do. 
and it will give you an extra strength for living the Christian life, for overcoming the obstacles that Satan wants to put in your way. I hope this is a blessing to you today. Take care.